Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We are continuing reading from Little Women today, and we are starting with Chapter 13, Castles in the Air. Lori lay luxuriously swinging to and fro in his hammock one warm September afternoon, wondering what his neighbors were about, but too lazy to go and find out. He was in one of his moods, for the day had been both unprofitable and unsatisfactory. <coughs> Excuse me. And he was wishing he could live it over again. The hot weather made him indolent, and he had shirked his studies, tried Mr. Brooks' patience to the utmost, displeased his grandfather by practicing half the afternoon, frightened the maid servants half out of their wits by mischievously, mischievously hinting that one of his dogs was going mad, and after high words with the stableman about some fancied neglect of his horse, he had flung himself into his hammock to fume over the stupidity of the world in general till the peace of the lovely day quieted him in spite of himself. Staring up into the green gloom of the horse chestnut trees above him, he dreamed dreams of all sorts and was just imagining himself tossing on the ocean in a voyage round the world when the sound of voices brought him ashore in a flash. Peeping through the meshes of the hammock, he saw the marches coming out as if bound on some expedition. What in the world are those girls about now, thought Laurie, opening his sleepy eyes to take a good look, for there was something rather peculiar in the appearance of his neighbors. Each wore a large flapping hat, a brown linen pouch slung over one shoulder, and carried a long staff. Meg had a cushion, Joe a book, Beth a basket, and Amy a portfolio. All walked quietly through the garden out at the back gate and began to climb the hill that lay between the house and the river. Well, that's cool, said Laurie to himself to have a picnic and never ask me. They can't be going in the boat for they haven't got the key. Perhaps they forgot it. I'll take it to them and see what's going on. Though possessed of half a dozen hats, it took him some time to find one. Then there was a hunt for the key so that the girls were quite out of sight when he leaped the fence and ran after them. Taking the shortest way to the boathouse, he waited for them to appear, but no one came and he went up the hill to take an observation. A grove of pines covered one part of it, and from the heart of, it, of this green spot came a clearer sound than the soft sigh of the pines or the drowsy chirp of the crickets. Here's a landscape, thought Laurie, peeping through the bushes and looking wide awake and good-natured already. It was rather a pretty little picture, for the sisters sat together in the shady nook with sun and shadow flickering over them, the aromatic wind lifting their hair and cooling their hot cheeks, and all the little wood people going on with their affairs as if there were no strangers but old friends. Meg sat on her cushion, sewing daintily with her white hands, and looking as fresh and sweet as a rose in her pink dress among the green. Beth was sorting the cones that lay thick under the hemlock nearby, for she made pretty things of them. Amy was sketching a group of ferns, and Joe was knitting as she read aloud. A shadow passed over the boy's face as he watched them, feeling that he ought to go away because uninvited, yet lingering because home seemed so, so very lonely, and this quiet party in the woods most attractive to his restless spirit. He stood so still that a squirrel, busy with its harvesting, ran down a pine cone close beside him, saw him suddenly, and skipped back, scolding so shrilly that Beth looked up, espied the wistful face behind the birches, and beckoned with a reassuring smile. "'May I come in, please, or shall I be a bother?' he asked. Meg lifted her eyebrows, but Joe scowled at her defiantly and said at once, "'Of course you may. We should have asked you before, only we thought you wouldn't care for such a girl's game as this.' I always liked your games, but if Meg doesn't want me, I'll go away. I've no objection if you do something. It's against the rules to be idle here, replied Meg, gravely but graciously. Much obliged. I'll do anything if you'll let me stop a bit, for it's as dull as the desert of Sahara down there. Shall I sew, read, cone, draw, or do all at once? Bring on your bears. I'm ready. And Laurie sat down with a submissive expression delightful to behold. Finish this story while I set my heel, said Joe, handing him the book. Yes, um, was the meek answer as he began, doing his best to prove his gratitude for the favor of an admission into the Busy Bee Society. The story was not a long one, and when it was finished, he ventured to ask a few questions as a reward of merit. Please, ma'am, could I inquire if this highly instructive and charming institution is a new one? Would you tell him? asked Meg of her sisters. He'll laugh, said Amy warningly. Who cares? said Joe. I guess he'll like it, added Beth. Of course I shall. I give you my word I won't laugh. Tell away, Joe, and don't be afraid. <laughs> the idea of being afraid of you? Well, you see, we used to play Pilgrim's Progress, and we have been going on with it in earnest all winter and summer. Yes, I know, said Laurie, nodding wisely. Who told you? demanded Joe. Spirits. 
No, I did. I wanted to amuse him one night when you were all away and he was rather dismal. He did like it, so don't scold, Joe, said Beth meekly. You can't keep a secret. Never mind, it saves trouble now. Go on, please, said Laurie. Oh, didn't she tell you about this new plan of ours? Well, we have tried not to waste our holiday, but each ha has had a task. The vacation is nearly over, the stints are all done, and we are ever so glad that we didn't dawdle. Yes, I should think so. And Laurie thought regretfully of his own idle days. <clears throat> Mother likes to have us out of doors as much as possible, so we bring our work here. For the fun of it, we bring our things in these bags, wear the old hats, use poles to climb the hill, and pay, play pilgrims, as we used to do years ago. We call this hill the Delectable Mountain, for we can look far away and see the country where we hope to live sometime. Joe pointed, and Laurie set up to examine, for through an opening in the wood, one could look across the wide blue river, the meadows on the other side, far over the outskirts of the great city, to the green hills that rose to meet the sky. The sun was low and the heavens glowed with the splendor of an autumn sunset. Gold and purple clouds lay on the hilltops and rising high into the ruddy light were silvery white peaks that shone like the airy spires of some celestial city. How beautiful that is, said Lori softly, for he was quick to see and feel beauty of any kind. It's often so and we like to watch it for it is never the same but always splendid, replied Amy. Joe talks about the country where we hope to live sometime. The real country, she means, with pigs and chickens and haymaking. It would be nice, but I wish the beautiful country up there was real, and we could even ever go to it, said Beth musingly. There is a lovelier country even than that, where we shall go by and by when we are good enough, answered Meg. It seems so long to wait, so hard to do. I want to fly away at once as those swallows fly and go in at that splendid gate. You'll get there, Beth, sooner or later. No fear of that, said Joe. I'm the one that will have to fight and work and climb and wade and maybe never get in after all. You'll have me for company if that's any comfort. I shall have to do a deal of traveling before I come inside of your celestial city. If I arrive late, you'll say a good word for me, won't you, Beth? Something in the boy's face troubled his little friend, but she said cheerfully with her quiet eyes on the changing clouds, If people really want to go and really try all their lives, I think they will get in, for I don't believe there are any locks on that door or any guards at the gate. I always imagine it... It is as it is in the picture, where the shining ones stretch out their hands to welcome poor Christian as he comes up from the river. Wouldn't it be fun if all the castles in the air which we could make come true and we could live in them, said Joe after a little pause. I've made such quantities it would be hard to choose which I'd have, said Laurie, lying flat and throwing cones at the squirrel who had betrayed him. You'd have to take your favorite one. What is it? asked Meg. If I tell mine, will you tell yours? Yes, if the girls will too. We will. Now, Lori. After I'd seen as much of the world as I want to, I'd like to settle in Germany and have just as much music as I choose. I'm to be a famous musician myself, and all the creation is to rush to hear me, and I'm never to be bothered about money or business, but just enjoy myself and live for what I like. That's my favorite castle. What's yours, Meg? Margaret seemed to find it a little hard to tell her. She said slowly, I should like a lovely house full of all sorts of luxurious things, nice food, pretty clothes, handsome furniture, pleasant people, and heaps of money. I am to be mistress of it and manage it as I like with plenty of servants, so I never need work a bit. How I should enjoy it, for I wouldn't be idle but do good and make everyone love me dearly. Wouldn't you have a master for your castle in the air? asked Glory slyly. I said pleasant people, you know, Meg carefully tied up her shoes as she spoke so that no one saw her face. Why don't you say you'd have a splendid, wise, good husband and some angelic little children? You know your castle wouldn't be perfect without, said Blunt Joe. You'd have nothing but horses, inkstands, and novels in yours, answered Meg petul petulantly. Wouldn't I, though? I'd have a stable full of Arabian steeds, rooms piled with books, and I'd ride out of a magic inkstand so that my work should be as famous as Laurie's music. I want to do something splendid before I go into my castle, something heroic or wonderful that won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I don't know what, but I'm on the watch for, for it. I think I shall write books and get rich and famous. That would suit me, so that is my favorite dream. Mine is to stay at home, safe with father and mother, and help take care of the family, said Beth contentedly. Don't you wish for anything else? asked Laurie. Since I had my little piano, I am perfectly satisfied. I only wish we may all keep well and be together. Nothing else. 
I have ever so many wishes, but the pet one is to be an artist and go to Rome and do fine pictures and be the best artist in the whole world, was Amy's modest desire. We're an ambitious set, aren't we? Every one of us but Beth wants to be rich and famous and gorgeous in every respect. I do wonder if any of us will ever get our wishes, said Lori, chewing grass like a meditative calf. I've got the key to my castle in the air, but whether I can unlock the door remains to be seen, observed, observed Joe mysteriously. I've got the key to mine, but I'm not allowed to try it. Hang college, muttered Lori with an impatient sigh. Here's mine, and Amy waved her pencil. I haven't got any, said Meg forlornly. Yes, you have, said Lori at once. Where? In your face. Nonsense, that's of no use. Wait and see if it doesn't bring you something worth having, replied the boy, laughing at the thought of a charming little secret which he fancied he knew. Meg colored behind the break, but asked no questions and looked across the river with the same expectant expression which Mr. Brooke had worn when he told the story of the night. If we are all alive ten years hence, let's meet and see how many of us have got our wishes or how much nearer we are then than now, said Joe, always ready with the plan. Bless me, how old I shall be. Twenty-seven, exclaimed Meg, who felt grown up already, having just reached seventeen. You and I will be twenty-six, Teddy, Beth twenty-four, and Amy twenty-two. What a venerable party, said Joe. I hope I shall have done something to be proud of, uh, proud of by that time, but I'm such a lazy dog, I'm afraid I shall dawdle, Joe. You need a motive, Mother says, and when you get it, she is sure you'll work splendidly. Is she? By Jupiter, I will, if I only get the chance, cried Laurie, sitting up with sudden energy. I ought to be satisfied to please Grandfather, and I do try, but it's working against the grain, you see, and comes hard. He wants me to be an Indian merchant, as he was, and I'd rather be shot. I hate tea and silk and spices and every sort of rubbish as old ships bring, and I don't care how soon they go to the bottom when I own them. Going to college ought to satisfy him, for I give him four years... If I give him four years, he ought to let me off from the business, but he's set, and I've got to do just as he did, unless I break away and please myself as my father did. If there was anyone left to stay with the old gentleman, I'd do it tomorrow. Laurie spoke excitedly and looked ready to carry his threat into execution on the slightest provocation, for he was growing up very fast, and in spite of his indolent ways, had a young man's restless longing to try the world for himself. I advise you to sail away in one of your ships and never come home again till you have tried your own way, said Joe, whose imagination was fired by the thought of such a daring exploit. That's not right, Joe. You mustn't talk in that way, and Lori mustn't take your bad advice. You should do just what your grandfather wishes, my dear boy, said Meg in her most maternal tone. Do your best at college, and when he sees that you try to please him, I'm sure he won't be hard or unjust to you. As you say, there is no one else to stay with and love him, and you'd never forgive yourself if you left him without his permission. Don't be dismal or fret, but do your duty, and you'll get your reward as good Mr. Brooke has by being respected and loved. What do you know about him? asked Laurie, grateful for the good advice, but objecting to the lecture. Only what your grandpa told us about him, how he took good care of his own mother till she died, and wouldn't go abroad as tutor to some nice person because he wouldn't leave her, and how he provides now for an old woman who nursed his mother and never tells anyone, but is just as generous and patient and good as he can be. So he is, dear old fellow, said Laurie heartily as Meg paused, looking flushed and earnest with her story. It's like Grandpa to find out all about him without letting him know and to tell all his goodness to others. Brooke couldn't understand why your mother was so kind to him, asking him over with me and treating him in her beautiful, friendly way. He thought she was just perfect and talked about it for days and days and went on about you all in flaming style. If ever I do get my wish, you see what I'll do for Brooke. Begin to do something now by not plaguing his life out, said Meg sharply. How do you know I do, miss? I can always tell by his face when he goes away. If you have been good, he looks satisfied and walks briskly. If you have plagued him, he's sober and walks slowly, as if he wanted to go back and do his work better. Well, I like that, so you keep an account of my good and bad marks in Brooke's face, do you? Don't be angry, and oh, don't tell him I said anything. It was only to show that I cared how you get on, and what is said here is said in confidence, you know, cried Meg. I don't tell tales, replied Laurie with his high and mighty air, as Joe called a certain expression which he occasionally wore. Please don't be offended. I didn't mean to preach or tell tales or be silly. I only thought Joe was encouraging you in a feeling which you'd be sorry for by and by. You are so kind to us, we feel as if you were our brother, and say just what we think. Forgive me, I meant it kindly. And Meg offered her hand with a gesture both affectionate and timid. 
Ashamed of his momentary pique, Lori squeezed the kind little hand and said frankly, I'm the one to be forgiven. I'm cross. I like to have you tell me my faults and be sisterly, so don't mind if I am grumpy sometimes. I thank you all the same. Bent on showing that he was not offended, he made himself as agreeable as possible, wound cotton for Meg, recited poetry to please Joe, shook down cones for Beth, and helped Amy with her ferns, proving himself a fit person to belong to the Busy Bee Society. The faint sound of a bell warned them that Hannah had put the tea to draw, and they would just have time to get home to supper. May I come again? asked Lori. Yes, if you are good and love your book as the boys in the primer are told to do, said Meg, smiling. I'll try. Then you may come, and I'll teach you to knit as the Scotchmen do. There's a demand for socks just now, added Joe, waving hers like a big blue worsted banner as they parted at the gate. That night when Beth played to Mr. Lawrence in the twilight, Laurie, standing in the shadow of the curtain, listened to the little David, whose simple music always quieted his moody spirit, and watched the old man who sat with his gray head on his hand thinking tender thoughts of the dead child he had loved so much. Remembering the conversation of the afternoon, the boy said to himself with the resolve to make the sacrifice cheerfully, I'll let my castle go and stay with the dear old gentleman while he needs me, for I am all he has. Let's go on to chapter 14, Secrets. Joe was very busy in the garret, for the October days began to grow chilly and the afternoons were short. For two or three hours, the sun lay warmly in the high window, showing Joe seated on the old sofa, writing busily with her papers spread out upon a trunk before her. Quite absorbed in her work, Joe scribbled away till the last page was filled when she signed her name with a flourish and threw down her pen, exclaiming, There, I've done my best. If this won't suit, I shall have to wait till I can do better. Lying back on the sofa, she read the manuscript carefully through, making dashes here and there and putting in many exclamation points. Then she tied it up with a smart red ribbon and sat a minute looking at it with a sober, wistful expression which plainly showed how earnest her work had been. Joe's desk up here was an old tin kitchen which hung against the wall. In it, she kept her papers and a few books. From this tin receptacle, Joe produced another manuscript and putting both in her pocket, crept quietly downstairs. She put on her hat and jacket as noiselessly as possible and going to the back entry window, got out on the roof of a low porch, swung herself down to the grassy bank and took a roundabout way to the road. Once there, she composed herself, hailed a passing omnibus and rolled away to town looking very merry and mysterious. If anyone had been watching her, he would have thought her movements decidedly peculiar for on alighting, she went off at a great pace till she reached a certain number in a certain busy street. Having found the place with some difficulty, she went into the doorway, looked up the dirty stairs, and after standing stuck still a minute, suddenly dived into the street and walked away as rapidly as she came. This maneuver she repeated several times, to the great amusement of a black-eyed young gentleman lounging in the window of a building opposite. On returning for the third time, Jo gave herself a shake, pulled her hat over her eyes, and walked up the stairs looking as if she were going to have all her teeth out. There was a dentist sign, among others, which adorned the entrance, and after staring a moment at the pair of artificial jaws which slowly opened and shut to draw attention to a fine set of teeth, the young gentleman put on his coat, took his hat, and went down to post himself in the opposite doorway, saying with a smile and a shiver, It's like her to come alone, but if she has a bad time, she'll need someone to help her home. In ten minutes, Joe came running downstairs with a very red face and the general appearance of a person who had just passed through a trying ordeal of some sort. When she saw the young gentleman... She looked anything but pleased and passed him with a nod, but he followed, asking with an air of sympathy, Did you have a bad time? Not very. You got through quickly. Yes, thank goodness. Why did you go alone? Didn't want anyone to know. You're the oddest fellow I ever saw. How many did you have out? Joe looked at her friend as if she did not understand him, but then began to laugh. There are two which I want to have come out, but I must wait a week. What are you laughing at? You are up to some mischief, Joe, said Laurie, looking mystified. I'd like to walk with you and tell you a secret, and if I tell you, you must tell me yours. I haven't got any, began Joe, but stopped suddenly, remembering that she had. You know you have. You can't hide anything, so up and fast or I won't tell, cried Laurie. Is your secret a nice one? Oh, isn't it? All about people you know and such fun. You ought to hear it, and I've been aching to tell it this long time. Come, you begin. You'll not say anything about it at home, will you? Not a word. Well, I've left two stories with the newspaperman, and he's to give his answer next week, whispered Joe. Hurrah for Miss March, the celebrated American authoress, cried Laurie, throwing up his hat and catching it again. Hush, it won't come to anything, I dare say, but I couldn't rest till I had tried, and I said nothing about it because I didn't want anyone else to be disappointed. It won't fail. Why, Joe, your stories are works of Shakespeare compared to half the rubbish that is published every day. Won't it be fun to see them in print, and shan't we feel proud of our authoress? Joe's eyes sparkled. Where's your secret? Play fair, Teddy, or I'll never believe you again, she said. 
I may get into a scrape for telling, but I didn't promise not to, so I will, for I never feel easy in my mind till I've told you any plummy bit of news I get. I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all? said Joe, looking disappointed. It's quite enough for the present, as you'll agree when I tell you where it is. Tell then. Laurie bent and whispered three words in Joe's ear, which produced a comical change. She stood and stared at him for a minute, looking both surprised and pleased, then walked on, saying sharply, How do you know? Saw it. Where? Pocket. All this time? Yes, isn't that romantic? No, it's horrid. Don't you like it? Of course I don't. It's ridiculous. It won't be allowed. My patience. What would Meg say? You are not to tell anyone, mind that. I didn't promise. That was understood, and I trusted you. Well, I won't for the present anyway, but I'm disgusted and wish you hadn't told me. I thought you'd be pleased. At the idea of anybody coming to take Meg away, no thank you. You'll feel better about it when somebody comes to take you away. I'd like to see anyone try it, cried Joe fiercely. So should I, and Laurie chuckled at the idea. I don't think secrets agree with me. I feel rumpled up in my mind since you told me that, said Joe rather ungratefully. Race down this hill with me and you'll be all right. No, was in, no one was in sight. The smooth road sloped invitingly before her, and finding the temptation irresistible, Joe darted away, soon leaving hat and comb behind her and scattering hairpins as she ran. Laurie reached the goal first and was quite satisfied with the success of his treatment, for his Atalanta came panting up with flying hair, bright eyes, ruddy cheeks, and no signs of dissatisfaction in her face. I wish I was a horse, then I could run for miles in this splendid air and not lose my breath. It was capital, but see what a guy it's made me. Go pick up my things, like a cherub as you are, said Joe, dropping down under a maple tree, which was carpeting the bank with crimson leaves. Laurie leisurely departed to recover the lost property, and Joe bundled up her braids, hoping no one would pass by till she was tidy again. But someone did pass, and who should it be but Meg, looking particularly ladylike in her state and festival suit, for she had been making calls. What in the world are you doing here? She asked, regarding her disheveled sister with well-bred surprise. Getting leaves, meekly answered Joe, sorting the rosy handfuls she had just swept up. And hairpins, added Laurie, throwing a half dozen into Joe's lap. They grow on this road, Meg. So do combs and brown straw hats. You have been running, Joe. How could you? When will you stop such romping ways, said Meg reprovingly. Never till I'm stiff and old and have to use a crutch. Don't try to make me grow up before my time, Meg. It's hard enough to have you change all of a sudden. Let me be a little girl as long as I can. As she spoke, Joe bent over the leaves to hide the trembling of her lips. For lately she had felt that Margaret was fast getting to be a woman, and Laurie's secret made her dread the separation, which must surely come sometime, and now seemed very near. He saw the trouble in her face and drew Meg's attention from it by asking quickly, Where have you been calling all so fine? At the gardener's, and Sally has been telling me all about Belle Moffat's wedding. It was very splendid, and they have gone to spend the winter in Paris. Just think how delightful that must be. Do you envy her, Meg? said Laurie. I'm afraid I do. I'm glad of it, muttered Joe, tying on her hat with a jerk. Why? asked Meg, looking surprised. Because if you care much about riches, you will never go and marry a poor man, said Joe. I shall never go and marry anyone, observed Meg, walking on with great dignity while the others followed, laughing, whispering, skipping stones, and behaving like children, as Meg said to herself. For a week or two, Joe behaved so queerly that her sisters were quite bewildered. She rushed to the door when the postman rang, was rude to Mr. Brooke whenever they met, would sit looking at Meg with a woebegone face, occasionally jumping up to shake and then to kiss her in a very mysterious manner. Laurie and she were always making signs to one another and talking about spread eagles till the girls declared they had both lost their wits. On the second Saturday after Joe got out of the window, Meg, as she sat sewing at her window, was scandalized by the sight of Laurie chasing Joe all over the garden and finally capturing her in Amy's bower. What went on there Meg could not see, but shrieks of laughter were heard, followed by the murmur of voices and a great flapping of newspapers. What shall we do with that girl? She will never behave like a young lady, sighed Meg. It's very trying, but we can never make her comme la faux, added Amy. In a few minutes, Joe bounced in, laid herself on the sofa, and affected to read. Have you anything interesting there? asked Meg with condescension. Nothing but a story won't amount to much, I guess, returned Joe, carefully keeping the name of the paper out of sight. You'd better read it aloud. That will amuse us and keep you out of mischief, said Amy in her most grown-up tone. What's the name? asked Beth, wondering why Joe kept her face behind the sheet. The Rival Painters. That sounds well. Read it, said Meg. With a loud <clears throat> and a long breath, Joe began to read very fast. The girls listened with interest, for the tale was romantic and somewhat pathetic, as most of the characters died in the end. I like that about the splendid picture, was Amy's approving remark as Joe paused. 
I prefer the lo lovering part. V Viola and Angelo are two of our favorite names. Isn't that queer, said Meg. Who wrote it, asked Beth, who had caught a glimpse of Joe's face. The reader suddenly sat up, cast away the paper, displaying a flushed countenance, and with a funny mixture of solemnity and excitement, replied in a loud voice, your sister. You, cried Meg, dropping her work. It's very good, said Amy critically. I knew it, I knew it. Oh, my Joe, I am so proud. And Beth ran to hug her sister and exult over this splendid success. Dear me, how delighted they all were, to be sure. How Meg wouldn't believe it till she saw the words Miss Josephine March actually printed in the paper. How graciously Amy criticized the artistic parts of the story and offered hints for a sequel, which unfortunately couldn't be carried out as the hero and heroine were dead. How Beth got excited and skipped and sang with joy. How proud Mrs. March was when she knew it. How Joe laughed with tears in her eyes as she declared she might as well be a peacock and done with it, and how the spread eagle might be said to flap his wings triumphantly over the house of March as the paper passed from hand to hand. Tell us all about it. When did it come? How much did you get for it? What will father say? Won't Lori laugh? cried the family all in one breath as they clustered about Joe. Stop jabbering, girls, and I'll tell you everything, said Joe, wondering if Miss Burney felt any grander over her Evelina than she did over rival painters. Having told how she disposed of her tales, Joe added, And when I went to get my answer, the man said he liked them both, but didn't pay beginners, only let them print in his paper, and notice the stories. It was good practice, he said, and when the beginners improved, anyone would pay. So I let him have the two stories, and today this was sent to me, and Laurie caught me with it, insisted on seeing it, so I let him. And he said it was good, and I shall write more, and he's going to get the next paid for, and I am so happy, for in time I may be able to support myself and help the girls. Joe's breath gave out here, and wrapping her head in the paper, she bedewed her little story with a few natural tears. For to be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart, and this seemed to be the first step toward that happy end. We'll stop there and start next time with a telegram. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.